Hello, I'm Pika, and welcome back. If you've played any amount of ranked battle in Splatoon, you're probably familiar with Rainmaker. It's generally regarded as the fastest paced mode in the game, and involves transporting the Rainmaker object from the middle of the map to the pedestal near the opponent's spawn, earning you more points the closer you get. This concept is unchanged in Splatoon 3, but they did add a new element to the mode, checkpoints. Now how exactly do these checkpoints work? Checkpoints act as a middle point between the middle of the map and the main Rainmaker pedestal and the enemy's base. Much like the final goal, you have to swim up the checkpoint with the Rainmaker and dunk it on top to clear it. Breaking the checkpoint is mandatory if you want to get a good score, since you're not able to score beyond the distance of the checkpoint without breaking it, even if you bring the Rainmaker itself past it. The final pedestal to KO the game isn't activated until all checkpoints are cleared either, just to be extra sure you don't try to skip over them. Because of this, there's nothing to gain from bringing the Rainmaker past the checkpoint without breaking it first. With that said, having to break the checkpoint isn't all that bad. Your team only has to dunk the Rainmaker on it once. After that, all the checkpoints reduce in height and are cleared for the rest of the match. Now notice how I said checkpoints plural. See, some maps have just one checkpoint as your only option, but others will have two. When that's the case, you can choose between either of them and are only required to clear one. As soon as a checkpoint is broken, the other will also fall and the final pedestal will activate, so you don't have to worry about the one you didn't go to. Also, when choosing which checkpoint to push, you only need to consider which one looks easier to reach based on the map and what your opponents are doing, since these pairs of checkpoints will always share the same score value. This means that whenever you have to pick between two of them, there's no inherent score advantage that makes one better than the other. Look at what's going on currently, decide which checkpoint looks the most comfortable to go for, and then play from there. One last mechanic to mention about checkpoints. In some instances, stage train will actually change in response to a checkpoint being broken. Only a couple maps have features like this currently, namely Mahi Mahi Resort and Sturgeon Shipyard, but it's a mechanic that may be expanded upon in the future. On Mahi, breaking the checkpoint will cause the water level to drop and expand the map. And on Sturgeon, it will cause the top left spinner to start its movement cycle, as it stays upright until that point on Rainmaker in particular. Now that we've gone over how these checkpoints work, how should we play around them and what options do they open up to us? Veterans of the Splatoon series likely know just how quickly a game of Rainmaker could end in the older games, since a convincing teamfight win at the start of the game could lead to the opponents reaching spawn and knocking out before you even had time to respawn in some cases. With checkpoints, that becomes a bit more difficult to do, since now you're required to break through those first and wait for the Rainmaker to be picked up again, giving defenders a lot more time to respawn. Additionally, on defense and more neutral situations, it makes keeping things under control in the early game a lot easier, since at first you only need to worry about keeping enemies away from one or two particular locations, depending on how many checkpoints there are. Once checkpoints are cleared, enemies can take any path of the Rainmaker that's available to them to score points. But that's only a privilege that they've earned once they've made it through those highly contested areas around checkpoints already. Though Rainmaker is still a chaotic and fast-paced mode, checkpoints and concept are your best friend in defensive situations, as the longer you can keep the opponents from breaking through them, the longer they'll be restricted on their own pushes. There's no doubt checkpoints were made with the defending team in mind, but there are still some neat things that the attacking team can do with them too. For one, breaking checkpoint is the only way, besides for knocking out the game entirely, for someone holding the Rainmaker to drop it without getting splatted. This means that on your first push to break checkpoint, you can be a bit more flexible around who on the team ends up grabbing the Rainmaker. Since they only have to hold it temporarily, you can have their main weapon granted back to them after clearing the checkpoint, without having to be sent all the way back to spawn, letting someone else grab it to continue the push from there. Another neat trick is how checkpoints can be used to extend overtime at the end of a game. Usually, when someone grabs the Rainmaker, they're put on a 60 second timer to either win the game or get as many points as they can before dying. As attackers, this timer can be stressful at the end of the game, since once overtime starts, that timer sets a clear deadline on how much wiggle room you have to make a potentially game-reversing play. Though it's rare, if by some chance your checkpoint still happens to be standing once overtime starts, you can break that checkpoint to drop the Rainmaker and pick it back up again resetting your 60 second timer, and effectively doubling the duration of overtime. Again, it's not often that you'll go through the whole 5 minute game without breaking checkpoints already, but as someone who's almost lost a tournament set by being caught off guard by this one, I just had to mention it. On top of these though, attackers can also use the checkpoints themselves to their advantage directly. One simple use is to use them as a bit of cover from enemy shots, even once the checkpoints sink down. Something more creative and fun though is using checkpoints as platforms to reach areas you normally couldn't, at least from that angle. Most maps have at least one jump that's only made possible by jumping off of the checkpoint and can be useful for taking an unexpected angle of attack or to move the Rainmaker forward even quicker. 
Many of these jumps are even possible once the checkpoints have been cleared and lowered down, and some of them, like on Hacklefish Market and Mincemeat Metalworks, can be incredibly useful as they can skip over parts of the intended Rainmaker path entirely, and earn you a lot of points instantly. There are also a couple honorable mentions here, specifically on Inkbot Art Academy and Wahoo World, since they do also have jumps like these, but they're only possible before the checkpoints have been cleared, making them pretty limited in application, but still kinda nice to know about. Overall, getting the hang of these jumps opens up even more options in an already dynamic game mode, and they're also just a lot of fun to do and surprise your opponents with. And there you have it, all the basics you need to know on how Rainmaker checkpoints work and some neat tricks you can do with them. Before I head out this time, I have one more thing. My old viewers from Splatoon 2 are probably tired of hearing this one by now, but I do paid coaching for Splatoon, and I'm glad to announce that Splatoon 3 lessons are now available on Metify. Regardless of your skill level, if you're looking to up your game in Splatoon 3 and feel stuck or you just don't know where to begin, you can book a coaching session with myself or one of the other talented coaches available at Metify, and we'll be happy to help you out. Link to my page is down below. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.